Um, right now, I'm going to introduce the speaker on the Economics Prize, uh, who is Fred Bereskin, uh, Assistant Professor in, of Finance in the Lerner College. Um, he earned his PhD at the University of Rochester in 2010 and then came here straight to UD. Uh, his research interests concern corporate governance, corporate finance, pensions, innovation. Um, and uh, I welcome Fred. Thank you very much, Doug, for, uh, uh, for the introduction, also for hosting this event, and also thank you for not making me last. Uh, also, uh, thank you if I uh, may be so bold as to uh, speak on behalf of uh, uh, the economics profession. It's a uh, pleasure that uh, uh, the Nobel Foundation uh, uh, may, corrected for Alfred Nobel's unfortunate oversight in his will, and uh, as well of 1896, and thus in 1968 uh, belatedly recognized the contribution of uh, economics. Uh, it's really great to talk about economics and finance at the same time as uh, those of other disciplines that have improved humanity. Medicine, physics, chemistry, literature, and something else. Oh yeah, peace. Uh, in fact, although these laureates received, that, that's as close as we can come to a finance joke uh, during, uh, during this symposium. Uh, in fact, although these laureates received the prize for their contributions to economics, I think you can make a really compelling argument that uh, uh, their ideas have also had a tremendous effect on world peace. Their ideas have helped improve financial well-being and have helped market development to the degree that increased interdependencies associated with markets and increased wealth make conflict uh, more expensive. I think that, uh, uh, that you can make a strong case for that. Anyway, that being said, let me uh, uh, move ahead and mention who the Nobel laureates are. There are three US economists, uh, Eugene Fama from University of Chicago, Lars Hansen, also from University of Chicago, and Robert Schiller from Yale University. Uh, they won the prize for their empirical analysis of uh, uh, asset prices. Speaking as someone in the finance department, it's really great to talk about uh, someone who's uh, uh, about uh, finance research that's won the prize. The last time that finance research has won the Nobel Prize in economics was in 1997. Uh, that prize, in case uh, uh, you're keeping track, was, uh, went to Robert Merton and uh, Myron Schulz for their work on financial derivatives. Uh, in preparing for the symposium, I was listening to an interview by, uh, uh, of, of Eugene Fama, and his opinion was that the uh, uh, most influential work in all of economics uh, was the Black Scholes paper on financial derivatives. So it's kind of interesting to see that uh, the 16 years later that, uh, uh, that, that Jean Fama has uh, uh, also received this award. Before I go into the details of the research, the recent financial crisis and housing crisis is really a healthy reminder to all of us how much asset prices matter and the critical work that these three people have done indicates how much we've learned about asset prices and in my opinion, more importantly, how many unresolved questions are still out there. I must acknowledge that for each of these three individuals, the work that they've done is more than what we can cover in 15 hours, let alone 15 minutes, but my comments will thus focus on what earned them the, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize. Just to mention though, for Fama, uh, he's made wide-ranging contributions to corporate finance, corporate governance, money and banking, organizational theory. And, however, his Nobel, together with that of uh, Schiller and Hansen, uh, was for his work on asset prices. So let me begin by discussing Fama. Uh, first, uh, as an undergraduate student, in case we have some, uh, some undergrads in the uh, room right now, he actually worked for a stock forecasting uh, service. He, uh, as part of his job, he was involved in trying to come up with uh, uh, asset pricing, uh, with trading strategies to help make money in the market. And what he invariably found was that uh, uh, the results would not hold out of sample. As a result, he eventually uh, worked into a special in graduate school, realized that in an efficient market, price changes cannot be forecast. His first key piece was in 1965, and throughout the 1970s, he had a lot of very influential papers that together kind of developed the efficient markets uh, hypothesis and gave a lot of uh, uh, empirical support for that. The idea is that markets are what we call informationally efficient if they summarize all the available information that might affect firm value. We probably all hear that idea and we think, well, that's an intuitive idea, of course it's the case. Uh, but there are a couple things that we need to mention. First, it's very difficult to establish that empirically, both with managing the data, statistical me uh, methods, and so on. 
And if we also think of, just if, if we turn on the radio nowadays, or we uh, uh, look at the newspaper, uh, coming down here uh, to work this morning, I was listening to CNBC on, uh, uh, on the satellite radio, and there's some oil analyst who is saying, I think oil prices are going to go up, and therefore you should buy an oil stock. You know, it, it, it's amazing to think that, that the research is so old, and still you have uh, uh, people making forecasts that all, all based on publicly available information that should be reflected in the stock prices, but people are, are trying to encourage uh, uh, trading strategies uh, based on that. The other issue, and we'll see this in more detail, especially when I talk about Schiller, is the idea of bubbles and crashes that when Fama received the prize, some people said, well, why, I don't understand why Fama received the prize. How can markets be efficient if we'd have a crash? I'll discuss that in more detail, but it shows uh, uh, one of the misunderstandings of, of the idea of the efficient markets hypothesis. The basic idea that, uh, that, all the, that prices just reflect all the available uh, information isn't that hard uh, uh, to comprehend, it's especially though hard to uh, establish. Uh, the approach of efficient markets, though, continues to be today the framework by which we and Fines have reviewed other anomalies. We're still reviewing anomalies today. It's amazing to think that the framework established earlier uh, continues to be the framework uh, uh, by which we'll evaluate cases where, uh, where the holdings are not clear. What I also like about the efficient markets hypothesis is it shows the beauty of uh, competition and free entry and free exit in financial markets. That's pretty amazing that consistently uh, in financial markets, self-interested participants have made the prices efficient for all of us. That if we don't know anything about a particular stock, we want to trade it, all these other people who are trading the stock have made that price an efficient price or a fair price uh, without us having to do anything. And all they had to do is uh, be motivated in their own self-interest. As a result of this, in the absence of the information that is not incorporating the stock price, uh, stock picking should not outperform random stock purchases in the context of... Uh, uh, of a well-diversified portfolio. This was still a revolutionary idea at the time, and it's still an amazing idea. The idea is that professionals do not do any better on average than amateurs. Think of anything else uh, where there's a professional, uh, and compare if you purchased a hamburger at McDonald's and a hamburger from some cordon bleu chef. I don't know if they make hamburgers, but the idea is that on average that wouldn't be any uh, better. At least you as a consumer wouldn't taste anything uh, that differently. Or that me as some guy off the street could do a surgery and then result would be the same as the top surgeon in, in the world. It's just an incredible idea to think, and it's all the more impressive when you think uh, uh, about people who teach MBAs, that, uh, 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 that even though you have a financial interest to say that the professionals uh, uh, should do better, the, the facts and the empirical results uh, go the other way. We see some uh, uh, real-world applications or implications of this theory today. For example, there's $7 trillion now in index funds. These are funds that are just invested directly in the market with uh, uh, passive rather than active management. This has led to dramatically lower costs for all of us, and it's enabled uh, just normal people to participate in the uh, financial markets. Locally, for example, we can see the effect of Vanguard and the effect that popularizing index funds and passive management has had for practically all of us in this room. It's made the markets much more accessible to normal people. Speaking of normal people, and also I'd like to say normal researchers, uh, the uh, FAMA recognized the importance of real-world data, and in addition to the statistical methods that he was at, uh, at the forefront of developing, he also helped, uh, helped make uh, uh, databases that we use today in research, uh, including the, resources, uh, the uh, databases that we use for stock and bond assets, what we call CRISP, bond portfolios, and also mutual funds. You'll see in the rest of tonight's speech that ultimately in finance, we need data to check the validity of our theories, and fama has been a leader in helping make this data uh, publicly available. In my opinion, the, uh, the work that Fama did on the efficient markets hypothesis should be enough for the Nobel Prize. In the rest of uh, uh, today's speech, though, I'll show how he further revolutionized the world uh, in combination with other scholars. At this stage, let me just pause and go to uh, uh, Robert Schiller. So we accept the idea that there's no free lunch and that uh, markets are broadly efficient and that prices should reflect all publicly available information. Schiller began to look into this, and one of the interesting implications that you might think about is to plot the fair price of an asset or the market versus the, uh, 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 the actual price. And Schiller did this in a very influential paper. It's in 1981 in the American Economic Review. And this is what he has. The, uh, uh, the very jumpy line is the, uh, is the actual level of the, uh, of the market, and the dashed line is what he perceives as the, uh, or what he calculates as the uh, uh, fair value. So it's almost like he said, fine, 
you, say, you guys say that the uh, uh, markets are efficient. Uh, maybe they're incorporating all uh, publicly available information, but then they're doing something crazy on top of that. And this, uh, this really revolutionized the world. This is one of the most highly, uh, uh, highly influential papers from, uh, uh, from that journal and really from, uh, from economics and, and finance uh, from that time. So what's going on? Well, uh, uh, what Schiller hypothesized, uh, hypothesizes is that there's a role of uh, psychology and over-optimism and over-pessimism is driving these results and the idea that the prices are jumping uh, up and down uh, so much. I should also mention that there's a University of Delaware connection to his work. Uh, Schiller lived right here in Newark, where his wife did her uh, PhD in psychology. She studied psychology under our psychology faculty, uh, George Sakella and Carol Lizard. He also presented at a conference here uh, hosted by the economics department. We have our members of the economics faculty uh, here today. Of the four papers presented at the uh, uh, conference, three of those uh, uh, authors of those papers went on to win Nobel Prizes. So in case any of you uh, uh, take bets on the Nobel Prize winner for, uh, uh, for next year, I'll let you know the fourth one and you can, you can gamble based on that. But no, but on a serious note, I think it's just really interesting to, uh, uh, to think about how he was involved with, uh, 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 with his work. Uh, those, uh, those papers were later put in a book by, by uh, our economics faculty, Jim Buckwitz, Ken Covert, and uh, Jeff Miller. Uh, you can consistently see the effect of psychology on his work. Uh, for example, he wrote, a Nobel, he wrote a book with the Nobel Prize winning economist George Akerlof, and he credits his wife with her uh, psychology research that, uh, uh, that she learned here. She she's, uh, works as a clinical psychologist. Virginia Schiller, a clinical psychologist, has been influential in impressing upon her husband the significance for economics of various principles of human psychology. Before I discuss the details of his research, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of his uh, uh, popular work. Uh, and uh, much of what, how he's popularly known. Uh, he pointed out, for example, real estate prices, how they rose by 7% in real terms between 1890 and 1997, and then by 85% between 97 and 2006. For US equities, for example, he, said, he found that the long-term average of stock prices are 16 times cyclically adjusted profits, and they're 44 times at the dot-com peak. He's been the forefront of discussing these markets Related to real estate, he helped develop the Case-Shiller Housing Index. He also uh, invented the Schiller, what we call the Schiller Price Earnings Ratio, to adjust for changes in profit margins across the business cycle. Also, for those of you who can't get enough finance, uh, you can also view his lectures online. Uh, they're really great to watch, so I uh, highly encourage it. Anyway, back to his study in the American Economic Review and uh, his insights. His findings are pervasive across markets. The idea is that rel higher prices relative to fundamentals mean lower future returns and vice versa. The, uh, uh, the implication from this figure, even though we see volatility, if, if we see the uh, change of the uh, uh, actual stock price uh, level versus the, uh, the fair value, is that, uh, that long-run returns are predictable. And that's not inconsistent with some of Fama's later research. Fama had a series of articles on the predictability of long-run asset returns. And it's interesting that we can appreciate this finding either from the perspective of the volatility of asset prices or by looking at return forecasting. So later on, Fama in the 1990s made a number of additional extensions to his work. Uh, he found that if low prices relative to some fundamentals suggest higher stock returns, we could, find, we could suggest that stocks with lower prices might indicate stocks with us uh, higher risks and, and then higher returns. And so this, together with the earlier work, has helped establish the, uh, uh, the new framework by which we evaluate asset prices. It's amazing to think that if we look back at Fama's career in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that much of his earlier uh, research helped uh, uh, establish the validity of the main asset pricing models that we used, and then his uh, subsequent work helped uh, uh, overturn some very important elements of it. So, you know, just think of any of these other disciplines where, where there's someone who uh, laid the huge, uh, the, laid the significant foundations, and then uh, uh, it, it did real work in, uh, in overturning it. So where do we stand now then? Well, the above insights, the previously mentioned insights into Fama's and Schiller's work, does not necessarily mean that markets are inefficient. We know that expected returns vary a lot. We also know that the time-varying expected returns account for a significant price volatility. What we can disagree on, though, is what drives the expected returns. Fama would suggest that, uh, uh, that these are driven by time-varying risk premiums. You can think of the recent financial crisis. 
Maybe now, especially obviously with benefit of hindsight, is we would see that asset prices were cheap, stock uh, prices were cheap. But when the world is about to fall apart, when all these prestigious companies are going out of business, uh, you know, what good will a stock certificate do you uh, if, uh, if you can't eat it, right? So, so obviously you'd forgo these, uh, your risk premium would go way up and that would help explain why the uh, uh, asset prices are so low. What Schiller suggests still is that the, uh, uh, variation, uh, the variations in the premium are so big, he sees irrational optimism and pessimism as a driver of this. And probably the one word that I'd use to uh, highlight the differences between Fama and Schiller would be the word bubble. Uh, uh, Schiller has uh, uh, been really good at identifying or discussing the role of bubbles. Fama's research suggests that it's not a bubble, it, it, it's just the estimate at the time of the uh, uh, asset prices. Fama and Schiller, along with others who've helped provide us with the understanding of uh, uh, empirical regularities. There's not a real disagreement on the empirical regularities. What we're still trying to figure out though is, uh, 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 is the facts before us. This brings us to, uh, to Hansen. He developed a highly influential statistical technique called the generalized method of moments. Uh, again, he contributed to so many disciplines in so many areas in finance and econometrics it's hard to do justice to as many contributions. This approach, though, helps us test and make use of the most efficient use of the data available, even when it's not all of the data or all the models that we uh, really need. Recall that with economics data, often we have a lot of difficulties with, uh, uh, with having a perfect model or, let's say, perfect data. Uh, statistics will typically impose very strict requirements, and Hansen's uh, innovations have helped us evaluate these relations even if we don't have a perfect model. Or perfect data, but just saying that captures some very important elements of that. Well, why is this important? We see repeatedly in, uh, throughout this uh, uh, speech in reviewing Fama's and Schiller's work the importance of properly analyzing data. The work that's been done, and more importantly, the work that continues to be done, would arguably not be possible without Hansen's contributions to the field. His approach has helped us evaluate Fama's and Schiller's hypotheses, and what's really nice when we look back at all three of them is it shows the importance of evaluating uh, all insights based on solid empirical evidence and proper uh, uh, statistical uh, techniques. So in conclusion, if we look at uh, all three of these people, what we really have to note is that's a very rational decision for the Nobel Prize. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Fred. There are questions for Fred. Uh, it's, it's a very good question. Let's repeat the question now. Oh yeah, the, the very good question was how do you calculate a fair price? Uh, in Schiller's uh, uh, paper, uh, it, it was probably the first guess, there, there are probably some issues with it. Uh, uh, so, so there are a lot of other approaches later on that people w would use. The idea is that if you think of a stock or the value, what that really is, is it's a piece of the value of the firm. And that should just be the present value of all those uh, uh, cash flows discounted by the appropriate discount rate. So there are some ways that you can estimate that, and, and that, that's the, the essence of the idea. It's easier said than done, obviously, but there, there's some acceptable ways to do it. Does so, that kind of get it? Oh, sorry. Well, let me follow that up with that then. So if there's a rational way to predict the fair value, why yeah. isn't that the market value? W so that's I mean, the essence In other words, of, why isn't that information already incorporated into the market price? So we have an estimate of the, uh, of the cash flows. There could be changes in the appropriate discount rate by which we're uh, estimating the cash flows, and that'd probably be consistent with, uh, with a lot of Fama's explanations. Uh, uh, Schiller would identify bubbles, but still, you know, he would see the, a fair price would be this, and, and the actual price would be this. Uh, participants in the market uh, might, might estimate different cash flows given their best estimate. And, and so really it, it tends to average down the market, but, but, but it, it, could, it doesn't mean that, uh, uh, that the price is always the right price. And the evidence of that is, again, thinking of recent bubbles, think of the, I don't know, Florida real estate bubble or, or Las Vegas uh, uh, real estate. Uh, at the time, you know, it was a fair price and that people are willing to pay to a, a bunch of smart people, a bunch of uh, sophisticated market uh, participants. Uh, it was probably not the right price in the end. So that's why we'd be cautious about calling it a, a bubble and it's not clear in the literature or not. Yeah, please. 
So I guess I see how that makes sense for the price of a piece of a company, but what yeah. about something for which the value is agreed upon by a group of people like real estate? How do you decide the fair price of my house? Um, there, there are ways that, uh, there are traditional uh, indicators that, that might be most consistent with, uh, uh, with long run averages, but uh, I think if you believe that the markets are broadly efficient, then the fair price is the price that someone's willing to pay for your house. That's like a circular. Uh, well, it, it's it, it's it's a circular argument in the sense that it, if you if if uh, if there are a lot of participants out there, no one will be able to buy the house from you for uh, uh, too low a price because someone else would always try to beat it. So it's it's just the market outcome. There there are there are acceptable metrics that you can look at for average prices of real estate versus historical metrics. Uh, but, uh, uh, but just broadly for any other asset, given that, that these markets are, are very efficient. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Stuart. Um, I, I'm still trying to figure out um, why uh, it is not simply and obviously the case um, that Fama is wrong and Schiller is right. Um, uh, he, I mean, you, know, you, you keep on saying, well, I don't want to call it a bubble because when you buy into it at the time, you think it's rational. Um, fine, but he asked the same person after they find out they bought at the top of the market, and they'll say, yeah, it was a bubble. I was wrong, mm -hmm. right? And the reason you're wrong is because there's no way the market can reflect all available information um, because nobody knows what all of the relevant information is right. You don't know for sure if you're if you know if you're looking at a company whether in fact the the demand for their products is going to uh, expand at the rate that they think. Right. Everybody has a guess on that, but nobody has enough data to know the answer. Right. So you know you know given the fact that there's an inherent uncertainty that you can't solve, it seems to me obvious that Schiller's right. It's got to go on the basis of feelings, like whether you feel optimistic or not. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, given the, you know, given those two things, um, it, you know, the fact that the, the purchaser himself will say, yeah, it was a bubble because I got it wrong. I thought it was going to go up and it went down. Um, why doesn't that prove that, it, that the efficient market hypothesis is just wrong? The markets aren't efficient. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for that question. A really excellent question. Uh, I think there are a few issues going on that I'd like to mention. Uh, one is that I wouldn't say that there are that there's no emotion involved in some of the individual traders. Clearly, you know, let's say I might trade in the market, I might feel, feel really excited and just buy everything, I don't know. Uh, but on average, we're talking about the most sophisticated market participants in the world, that if someone is uh, irrationally exuberant, uh, the other market participants will find a way to make money out of that. They have models and, and whatnot. The, the other thing I think, the, the essence of the point is just because the markets have crashed, let's say, or conversely that they soared beforehand, it doesn't mean that the markets were wrong at the time. You had plenty of people out there in the markets looking at all available information, and their, their best estimate at the time was that the price that they were buying was the fair price. Again, you could even have a computer be doing this. And I guess the, convert, the, the opposite end that I say is if, uh, uh, if emotion is driving the market, then what I would want to do is I would want to create a computer program that would trade against emotion because I can, uh, uh, I can forecast things and whatever the emotion is driving the prices, I'll trade against that. And then on average, it'll, uh, uh, it'll even out. It's, um, we can say now that some prices were corrected, but how can we say that Las Vegas real estate was a bubble where people would pay $500,000 for a property that used to be 100,000 when New York real estate Maybe it's not a bubble right now, where you pay a million dollars for some small apartment. Uh, it, it's a really compelling issue, but just because prices were corrected, it's not enough to say that everyone was wrong. If they're only, we can only say that they were wrong after the fact, but at the time, given the uh, efficiency of the markets and the number of market participants. All right, I think we're going to have oh, to I'm stop sorry. there. No, okay, this is good. You. But um, this proves my, my belief that, in fact, there is a large amount of interest in the economics prize, and I'm sure Fred will be around to answer any additional questions and continue the discussion um, after the last talk. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much.